So we've been working on a problem that I plan that I'm continuing today, looking at the design of a aeration tank for a secondary treatment system using activated sludge. So we've done some sizing. Okay, so if you haven't watched it, make sure you watch the um, lectures from Friday and Monday because they're all linked together on wastewater treatment. So we've sized the tank and it is 1,650 cubic meters. That's our size. We've determined the mean cell residence time for as 8.18 days. So think about that if we were to follow a packet of microorganisms in this basin, which go into, into the secondary settler, they settle out in that clarifier and then are recycled back. So the mean cell residence time is significantly longer than the hydraulic residence time, which is 3.05 hours. When we're designing these systems, we're designing them, remember, to remove soluble BOD. So when we're looking at this removal, we're focused on in the aeration tanks on soluble BOD removal. So the soluble BOD from the primary clarifiers is 84 milligrams per liter. And we determined that the effluent from the secondary clarifiers has a soluble BOD of 7.3 milligrams per liter. The total allowable BOD in the effluent is 20 milligrams per liter. And the allowable suspended solids is also 20 milligrams per liter. So before we proceed, let's look at the entire treatment process. The raw sewage comes into the plant it's removed or treated through screening. So we have a bar rack. These, the bars on the rack typically are about one to two inches apart. We're removing the very large material. Rags, um, toys that a child flush down the toilet. Material that would be detrimental to the pumps, would clog pipes, et cetera. The water then flows from through the bar, flows through the bar rack and then into a grit chamber. So in the grit chamber, we're removing in, inorganic material referred to as grit, sand, gravel, um, coffee grinds, eggshells. But we want to keep the, the organics in suspension. The grit tends to, this tends to be the smelliest part of the plant. Um, while the grit is, or is inorganic, there's a significant amount of organic material in this waste. It then may flow into an equalization basin. Doesn't necessarily have to have equalization, but in equalization, what we're looking at is equalizing the flow and the strength of the wastewater. From there, it then moves into a primary settling basin. So we have quiescent flow. We're achieving about 60% removal of soluble, of, sorry, of suspended solids, 60% removal of suspended solids, and about 30% removal of BOD. But the removal of BOD that we achieve is organic material that is attached to, inner, to suspended solids. So we refer to that as suspended BOD. We get no soluble BOD removal. Then water from the effluent from the primary basin 
moves into a biological treatment process. And that's what we're focused on here. And we're looking at activated sludge. So we have a concentrated suspension of microorganisms that we're then using to degrade the soluble BOD. So here are several photos from the East, Lan East Lansing wastewater treatment plant. We have air flowing. So we're aerating the waste, providing an environment that's suitable for the microorganisms to degrade the soluble organics. The process includes both an aeration tank as shown here and the settling tank, the secondary clarifier. The sludge from that, some portion is recycled and some portion is wasted. And then here is our effluent. We've gone through and developed a mass balance. We develop a mass balance for the substrate and the effluent. So that's the S, so that's your soluble BOD. And the biomass, that's the X. Okay. So the, that is the mixed liquor, volatile suspended solids. So X represents the concentration of microorganisms in the aeration tank. We've sized the tank. We've determined the mean cell residence time, the hydraulic detention time. This was given. We determined the effluent based on the allowable criteria. So the next thing we need to determine is the food to microorganism ratio. So we want to make sure that we provide sufficient food for the microorganisms, but not too much food. If we provide too much food for the microorganisms, what happens? Why is that of concern? So in terms of our treatment process, if we provide too much food, what happens? So the concentration of BOD in our effluent will be high. If we provide too little food, then we don't have unhappy microorganisms and potentially they start dying. So the food is that soluble BOD. The mic mass of microorganisms is the volume in the tank divided, I'm oh, sorry, times the concentration of microorganisms, which we represent by X. So this is 0 0.150 meters cubed per second times 86,400 seconds per day times the 84 milligrams per liter, that initial BOD, times the volume of the tank, times the concentration of microorganisms, which on Monday we stated was 2,100 milligrams per liter. And that is equal to 0 0.31, and that's milligrams of BOD per milligram of VSS per day. And this should be in the range of 0.2 to 0.4 for completely mixed systems. And what we said on Monday was that we were designing a completely mixed system. So we're right within the range that we need to be. The next part of this is estimating the return sludge pumping rate. So remember, we have a aeration tank here. We have flow then into the secondary effluent, the secondary clarifier. We have our effluent here. We have sludge from the bottom. We have some portion that we're wasting and we have some portion that we are returning back to the plant. 
so when we're looking at the mass balance, we're looking at this entire system here. Okay. Why do we return sludge back to the Eurasian tank? Exactly, to maintain an appropriate population of microorganisms. The concentration of suspended solids entering the plant is about 250 milligrams per liter. Okay, we get about 60% um, removal and primary settling. So you can see the concentration is significantly smaller. Okay. So in order to maintain this, this high concentration of microorganisms, we need to recycle and return those microorganisms. There are worker bees. So in order to do this, okay, we will use a series of equations. I will not derive all of the equations. If you textbook goes through all of these, Equations are also in the reference, the FE reference handbook. The waste flow rate can be determined from the product of the volume of the aeration tank times the times X, the mixed liquor volatile suspended solids, divided by the mean cell residence time times the concentration of microorganisms in the return sludge line. This is equation 2312 in your textbook. It is 1132 in P's. And it is a slight modification of the equation on the reference, the FE reference handbook. And it assumes that the concentration of suspended solids or volatile suspended solids in the effluent is negligible. And I apologize for all the lines. So X sub E times Q sub E is much less than X W Q W, okay? So that's a simplification of that equation from the FE reference handbook. So what you're given is that X prime is equal to 10,000 milligrams per liter. The, the prime here denotes suspended solids. Without the prime is volatile suspended solids. So the prime includes inorganic material. And what you're also told is that the VSS, so this is our volatile suspended solids, is equal to the suspended solids concentration divided by 1.43, or that it's 70% of the suspended solids concentration. And that is equal to 6,993 milligrams per liter. Therefore, QW is equal to 1650 meters cubed times 2100 milligrams per liter divided by 8.18 days times the concentration that we just calculated. And that is equal to 87 meters cubed per day. In order to determine Q sub R, we need to draw a mass balance around the sedimentation tank. So this is our secondary clarifier. We have Q plus QR, and the same thing that I showed in the previous slide. We have X prime. Now we could develop this with either X or X prime, but we're gonna use, we'll use X prime here. We have our effluent leaving, and we have X prime in the effluent. We have our sludge, so we have QW, and then we have QR and XR prime. And this is also XR prime. So we can write a mass balance. We have flow in Q 
plus QR times X prime minus QR times X prime R plus QW times X prime R minus QE times X sub E. And we're going to assume that this is negligible because the concentration in that effluent is small. And if we're at steady state, this is equal to zero. Excellent. So Q sub R is equal to Q X prime minus Q W times X. I apologize for the lines. X sub R prime minus X. So all I've done is rearrange that previous equation. And that is equal, Q was, and this was stated in the original problem. So our flow rate is 12,960. Our MLSS is 3,000, and that was also stated, minus, QW, which we just calculated as 87.11 meters cubed per day times 10,000 milligrams per liter. And we're going to divide that by 10,000 minus the 3,000. And that is equal to 9,667 9, meters cubed per day or 0.112 meters cubed per second. And this should be about 25 to 100%. So notice we're recycling, our recycle flow is significant compared to our initial flow. And this is 0.112 divided by 0.15, which was our Q, which was what we were originally provided with. And that is equal to 0.75. So we're right within that range. Questions? The homework is very similar to this. And you'll go through the exact same process. The next thing, and really the last thing we're asked for, is to estimate the mass of sludge to be wasted each day. Why do we need to know this information? From a design perspective, why would you need to know this information? Exactly, how much to dispose of. We will typically treat this, we will dewater it, um, perhaps thicken it. We may need to stabilize it. We need to design all of those subsequent processes. So we need to know what the massive sludge is that we're wasting each day. Your sludge production is, what we're trying to determine is the mass to be wasted. And that is equal to the increase in MLSS minus the suspended solids lost in the effluent. Equation 25, or sorry, 2337 provides us with an estimate of the observed growth rate. And this is the growth rate of the microorganisms. This is equal to Y, which was given, plus KD, which is the endogenous decay rate, times the mean cell resonance time. And that is equal to 0.6 over 1 plus 0.05 inverse days times 8.18 days. And that is equal to 0.426 milligrams of VSS per milligram of BOD removed. The net waste activated sludge produced per day is given by equation 2338. And that is P sub X 
which is the net waste activated sludge produced per day is equal to Y observed times Q times S sub zero minus S sub E times the conversion factor. So that is equal to 0.426 milligrams of VSS per milligram of BOD removed times Q, which is 0.15 meters cubed per second times 86,400 seconds per day times S sub zero, which was 84 milligrams per liter, minus 7.3 milligrams per liter, times 10 to the minus six kilograms per milligram, times a thousand liters per meter cubed. And notice I've this. Haven't used this conversion factor. I've basic. I've checked and used all of the appropriate conversion factors. So seconds cancel, um, meters cubed cancel, liters cancel, milligrams cancel, and we're left with milligrams cancel there, and we're left with kilograms per day. Okay, and this is equal to. 423 kilograms of VSS per day. Remember, we said that VSS was 70% of the total suspended solids. So our total sludge production is equal to 1.43, which is just the inverse of 0.7 times 423. And that is equal to 604 kilograms of suspended solids per day. Not quite done yet. We need to calculate the mass leaving in the effluent. And that is Q sub E times the suspended solids concentration or Q minus QW. And it's back if we go back and look at our mass balance times X prime, so we're looking at suspended solids, and that is equal to 12.960 minus 87.1 meters cubed per day times 20 milligrams per liter. That was their allowable suspended solids concentration times the appropriate conversions you have 10 to the six milligrams per kilogram and a thousand liters per meter cubed. And that is 257 kilograms per day. So that's the mass leaving in the effluent. So the mass to be wasted is 604, which is what we calculated as the net production minus 257 or 346 kilograms per day. And we can finally calculate the sludge volume because we, we design our subsequent processes on the volume. So the specific gravity of the sludge, I'm gonna give it to you, this is given and it's a typical value, it's about 1.01. The percent solids is about 2%. So those are typical values. So the sludge volume is equal to the mass times 100 divided by the specific gravity of the sludge times the density of water times the percent solids. So that is equal to 346 kilograms per day times 100 divided by 1.01 times 1,000 
kilograms per meter cubed times the 2%. And that is equal to 17.1 meters cubed per day. So that is our final sludge volume. So that is the entire design. This is a much more simplified version. If you go through the textbook, you see that there's actually a more complicated, complex version. Uh, often this is now done with computer programming. Um, but give, I wanna give you a sense of how we go through the process of designing. Any questions about any of these calculations? Okay. The major issue is keeping track of your terms. So X is what? So we use X to represent the concentration of what? Okay, that's your microorganisms. And that's your volatile suspended solids. X prime is what? That's your suspended solid. So that includes the inorganic fraction. So it's your microorganisms plus the inorganics. S is equal to what? So S, X, S is your soluble BOD, okay? So it's really important that you keep those terms straight because everything depends on them. So where was S used? Let's go back. We used S right here. So that was the soluble BOD back when we determined F over M, we used S there. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. What we're going to spend the last, we've got about 11 minutes, um, just kind of going, looking at some of the other processes that we could also uh, use for secondary treatment. So we've been talking about activated sludge. We've been talking about dispersed growth, where we have the microorganisms dispersed, mixed in with the waste that we're trying to degrade. We can also use oxidation ditches, which are also a dispersed growth treatment. So here, what we have is basically an oval. Think of it as a large oval. And the water flows around this oval. Okay. Often there will be sections of this will be anaerobic and other sections aerobic. The reason for that is we can trick the organisms into denitrifying or uh, taking up phosphorus by cycling through an aerobic anaerobic cycle. So it's quite complex, but it's basically a way of tricking the organisms um, to get better removal. These are typically used for smaller systems. Um, Dr. Greg Tatera from the uh, MHOG plant uh, over just east of us on the Howell area will be speaking at one of the Tuesday um, tutorials about their plant and where they're using oxidation ditches. We can also use aerobic or stabilization ponds. These are typically are very shallow ponds. Often light penetrates to the bottom We'll often use algal photosynthesis to help maintain oxygen, at least during the day when photosynthesis occurs. And they tend to be quite large as you see in the picture on the right. The goal is to convert organic matter to CO2, nitrate, sulfate, and phosphate. We can also use Fixed growth, and here, think of this as we have some sort of solid media, and we have the microorganisms attached to that solid media. The flow is past the microorganisms, and as the water flows, the 
um, soluble material, that organics diffuse into that microorganism biofilm and are degraded. So this is a trickling filter. They're also called biotowers. Um, and typically what you have is some sort of a um, sprinkling device on the top that rotates. And water then flows down, percolates through this media. So you can see there's different types of media that and attached to the media are the microorganisms. So here's our flow. And so tip your water from the primary sedimentation is pumped up, flows down through, and then out to a secondary clarifier. So this is fixed growth approach. We can also use rotating biological contactors, which again, we have a solid support. Um, they're lined here. So basically, there would be a solid support here. On the solid support are the microorganisms. These rotate. And you can see they're submerged in the wastewater. When they come up, they're aerated by air. And then they just cycle around. Typically, these are operated in series. So you've got primary settling, a series of RBCs, as you can see. So these would be one to two. So the water's flowing from one into the next, and then into secondary settling. We also have moving bed bioreactors. These are relatively new process. Basically, they're putting these um, support disks in an activated sludge system. So now instead of the microorganisms being dispersed, now the microorganisms are attached to these disks. And with these, you can, in some cases, actually eliminate the need to recycle the microorganisms because those microorganisms are attached. And I've shown it to you both um, systems. One, and you can see actually where it's a st anaerobic, aerobic stage followed by an anaerobic, I'm sorry, by second stage aerobic. So they're both aerobic systems. And the other, the first one doesn't have recycle, and the second one does. And it really depends on the design of these systems. Finally, we can have what was referred to as advanced or tertiary treatment. So we've gone through preliminary, primary, and secondary treatment. However, because of the quality or the desired use of that wastewater, we may need subsequent treatment. So this could also be for reuse, where, and you're, we're gonna see more and more of this, where we're looking at direct reuse of that wastewater. We reuse it. We discharge to the Red Cedar, we discharge then, which flows into the Grand River, which flows into Lake Michigan, and guess what? Grand Rapids drinks that water from Lake Michigan, Holland, Chicago. So they're drinking some of the wastewater that we discharge. That's indirect reuse. Direct reuse is we're actually taking that wastewater, that effluent, and directly reusing it. So in those cases, we may need to get significant removal of organic matter beyond that 20 milligrams per liter. We may need to remove suspended solids beyond the 20 milligrams per liter. 
or we may need to remove nutrients to prevent eutrophication. We may need to remove pharmaceuticals. We're seeing much more in that, especially where we're looking at reuse. So these <clears throat> can include processes from chemical precipitation. So for instance, for phosphorus removal, and I've shown you here the equations for ferric <clears throat> chloride, addition and reaction with phosphate to precipitate ferric phosphate, or the production of struvite, which again is a solid form of phosphate. We can use granular media filtration. We've talked about that. We will talk about membrane filtration and we can use that especially for water reuse. <clears throat> and the next unit we'll be looking at is carbon adsorption. And we can look at that for micropollutant removal. Final process <clears throat> is disinfection. Now, this may occur disinfection of the secondary clarifier effluent or the effluent from the tertiary process. We want to reduce pathogen levels to acceptable values. If we use chlorine, then we chlorinate, we provide contact, and then we dechlorinate. And we dechlorinate because we don't want the chlorine to be killing off the microorganisms, the biota in the receiving body of water. Okay. We also want to reduce the contact time because we don't want disinfection byproducts. Because of the production of those disinfection byproducts and because it includes both a chlorination and a dechlorination stage, you're seeing far more plants switch to UV disinfection. And lastly, <clears throat> we often will increase the dissolved oxygen levels. So to, often it's a cascading little stream so that the water is aerated so that there isn't a significant reduction in dissolved oxygen when it mixes with the receiving body of water. So based on this series of lectures, you should be able to state the goals of wastewater treatment and its individual processes, explain how each treatment process operates, complete a basic set of calculations for wastewater treatment plant design.